So maybe um, just for clarification, one, one of our speakers unfortunately um, does not have time today. Um, so we will replace a speech by a video that yeah. we will just put on from our side. He re pre recorded it for us so that he's also able to participate. And we hope that he will be able to manage to join for the discussion still. Uh, we do not know it yet, but the probability is good. So just for everybody to know that um, once his speech, Miles Paget's speech is in introduced, we will just play the video for him. Okay, okay, so then we can we can stick to the schedule, right? Absolutely. That's uh, that's that's perfect, and I um, think this statement comes perfectly in time. Um, so if you then would allow Lisa, I would uh, would uh, would would start. I would love. Um, to. Okay, so um, yeah, welcome to panel number three. Um, in his opening address this morning, uh, Sir Anton Muscatelli referred um, to this uh, panel and emphasized the importance of knowledge transfer to industry and, and the wider society. And it probably doesn't uh, come as a surprise. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, in recent years, the discussion about the third mission, as it's called, of university has gained a lot of uh, momentum. And um, the reason I think is that in a broad sense, um, transfer is actually one of the major mechanisms by which universities can have a positive societal impact. Um, so the objective of um, this panel is, is twofold. Um, first of all, we want to share best practice approaches and, uh, and new ideas in knowledge transfer. And um, second, we also want to discuss ways how universities can actually um, bridge uh, or be a bridge between Scotland and Lower Saxony or um, play a role in connecting various stakeholders from Scotland and Lower Saxony. So who is on the panel? Um, welcome again. I uh, briefly introduce uh, everybody. Um, so my name is Burkhard Funk. Um, I'm a professor uh, for information systems here at Leuphana University. And uh, with respect to um, the topic of this panel, I can truly say that knowledge transfer really plays an important role uh, in my work, formerly as part of the presidential board, um, as a researcher and, um, and a teacher, but also as an entrepreneur and uh, an advisory board uh, member. Uh, we just agreed that um, I give a brief um, intro to my esteemed colleagues here um, uh, on, the, uh, on the panel so that after that we can really focus um, on this exciting uh, topic. So um, let me start with uh, Hiltraud Kasperhine. Um, she's a professor uh, of cultural uh, German studies and uh, linguistics at the University of uh, Göttingen. And uh, her focus is on uh, language education and cultural studies. And um, she's also a vice president uh, for uh, internationalization um, in Göttingen. Sarah English, um, uh, she uh, is a EU uh, policy manager and um, head of the Brussels uh, office of Scotland Europa. And um, Sarah, I have to, uh, I have to admit, uh, I, I had to look it up, um, what uh, Scotland Europa is actually doing. And it, uh, became clear to me that it's becoming more and more important what you're actually doing. So um, uh, Scotland Europa is an organization that uh, promotes the Scottish interests in the EU and uh, organizations of the EU. So Manfred Krafczyk, um, he is a professor uh, for civil engineering at the TU uh, Braunschweig and focuses on uh, computational modeling in um, civil engineering. Um, and uh, having this background, he is uh, also a vice president uh, for digitalization and um, technology transfer uh, of the Technical University and therefore really um, working at the core of uh, what we are actually uh, doing in this, um, in this panel. Thank you. Miles Paget, um, uh, and we just heard that, uh, will hopefully join us um, later. Um, he is a professor for uh, physics at the University of um, Glasgow, and uh, he works on the physics of light 
uh, which uh, for itself is probably exciting enough. But I think the reason that he joins us today is uh, in particular that he is the principal investigator um, of a transfer organization called Quantic. Um, and uh, he will report on that uh, probably in more detail. And last, uh, but definitely not least, uh, Christina von Haaren. Um, she's a professor for environmental science at uh, the University of uh, Hannover. And uh, she works on uh, landscape planning and uh, nature conservation uh, and agriculture. And um, she's also a vice president uh, for international affairs at uh, the Leibniz University of uh, Hannover. So um, welcome again. Um, thanks, for, thanks for joining us. Um, you see uh, this panel is uh, heavily packed with experts um, that uh, I'm sure have many, many insights to share um, on, uh, on knowledge transfers and uh, related ideas. Um, however, I uh, have to say that um, each of you will only have uh, 10 minutes um, uh, to, to share your ideas uh, on that. And uh, uh, I'm, I, I hope I do not have to intervene uh, because there's so much to say. Uh, but uh, now with no further ado, I would uh, really say let's uh, jump right into it. And um, I would like to hand over to uh, Hiltraut Kasper Hähne then, um, if you would like to take over. Feel free. You're, you're still muted, Hiltraut. Yes, thank you so much and thank you for inviting me to this conference. Is a pandemic a watershed for internationalization? Asked Betty Lesk in an article in the University World News this spring. Numerous commentaries have been put forward as well as reports from first empirical studies on how digitalization well, let's better say the gigantic leap in digitalization that we've now taken by force of necessity has impacted communication and global collaboration in higher education and between higher education institutions and stakeholders from society. If we take a hopeful outlook on the current situation, then we must recognize that we find ourselves in an incredibly dynamic situation. Emergency remote online teaching has been an overwhelming experience for our academics and our students. As we now settle into the new normal, we as university leadership need to capitalize on the momentum surrounding digitally supported teaching and learning to foster international collaboration. The abstract for this panel states that awareness building, knowledge exchange and collaboration move easily across borders, time zones, and diverse compositions of partners if you have the fitting digital tool set, skill set, and mindset. The fitting digital tool set is something that we as university leaders can provide. This has been one of our core tasks during the past months. A fitting digital skill set, a certain tech savviness, is a bit harder to develop. And I'm sure that you have made the same experience, checking webcams, looking for the access key to a virtual room meeting, or repeatedly asking, can you hear me now in a web conference? But a fitting mindset, I would like to argue, remains a challenge. The pandemic has made it evident that we do not only need students, academics, support staff and leadership who are open to using digital tools. The current situation is exactly why, for example, we need students who are globally responsible citizens and to understand, as Robin Hunt argues, global phenomena can seek xenophobic and cultural bound reactions for what they are and are prepared to work with colleagues around the world in academia and society to address global crisis. Virtual exchange with universities or other stakeholders can provide an adequate setting for students' academic and personal development and growth. Virtual exchange understood as sustained, technology-enabled, people-to-people education programs or activities in which constructive communication and interaction takes place between individuals or groups who are geographically separated and or from different cultural backgrounds. At the University of Göttingen, we have been supporting academics 
in creating such formats for a couple of semesters already. In the months ensuing the lockdown, the significance of these formats for our students and for our international partnerships has become evident. We are currently in the fortunate situation that we can put a limited amount of funding from the Central Study Quality Funds in Lower Saxony towards this goal, 1.2 million euro, as well as substantial third party funding that the university has been awarded in the DAED programs, International Mobility and Cooperation to Digitalization, 2.3 million euro, and International Virtual Academic Collaboration with 0.5 million euro. And last but not least, in the context of our European University Network and Light, funded with 5 million euro from the European Union. To harness the potential of these projects, we are currently scrutinizing the status quo of our virtual exchange initiatives and pathways to a strategic expansion. Part of an ongoing discussion at our university is the integration of an intercultural communication component with designed reflective tasks into our just mentioned projects and thereby into our joint classroom course and carefully formulated international and intercultural learning outcomes. The friction of different voices, languages, perspectives, and learning styles in the joint classroom may be challenging at times, but with guided reflection, it will reveal to students the complexities of global linkages and show what has shaped their perspectives. Moreover, I expect that in line with the thematic focus on five of the sustainable development goals, will provide ample opportunity for our students to engage in international dialogues, appreciate other, both local and global perspectives, and develop a critically informed stance of their own. Amongst the vast array of learning formats, we envision as best practice challenge-based living labs in which students researchers and representatives from politics, society, and the business sector can meaningfully interact to solve local challenges and connect to our partners to share and discuss their solutions. Let me give you two examples. Discussions with students and lecturers in the area of integrated plant and animal breeding reveal the importance of cooperation between research and professional practice. Together with international breeding researchers, as well as representatives of internationally operating breeding companies, learning material for the inverted classroom on the topic of breeding programs has been developed. The model is thereby expanded in its content. Transnational standards of different breeding programs are discussed and implications of research for practice are addressed. At the same time, students gain insights into international companies and professional practice and make first contacts with companies, including internationally active firms in the region. We have also launched a virtual exchange project in the field of breeding tropical, subtropical staple crops and the impact on global food security, in which teaching staff together with an Ugandan partner university are designing and developing the course. The course will give students insights into breeding different staple crops in Germany and Africa, and insight into the work of locally and globally run NGOs in agriculture, and thus involves also a large number of guests from these organizations. During the course, joint project work and joint presentations with the lecturers and students of the partner universities and the NGOs shall promote international and intercultural skills and global awareness of the students. The joint classroom therefore gives students access to a variety of new perspectives, but also helps them to develop digital competences and learn about professional perspectives and career paths in NGOs. So the virtual exchange and the living lab are important tools for supporting knowledge transfer between students, universities, and international stakeholders of business and society. This brings me to the last point in my line of argumentation. We urgently need to untether global learning for mobility. An almost universal initial reaction to the lockdown was to use digital tools as a quick fix in times of closed borders. However, instead of continuing to rely on student mobility for internationalization activities, we need to shift our gaze to more comprehensive internationalization at home. Next to a vast area of analogous tools and formats, 
that can harness the diversity in our local communities. We can embrace virtual exchange with partner universities and our stakeholders to make collaboration and international viewpoints and conversations more accessible to a wider group of students. In recent years, the University of Göttingen has been developing its branding education for a global world at home and abroad. The strategic approach positions mobility from a semester abroad to short-term programs, stays abroad for internships and research activities, and internationalization at home side by side as mutually reinforcing each other. We maintain strong partnerships also well beyond our European ties with the Enlight Network, the Coimbra Group and the Guild. It is likely that mobility of students and staff will research rather quickly and more easily with our European partners, while mobility between Göttingen and our partners in the Global South will likely need more time to recover from the pandemic. However, it is important that we sustain all these partnerships and virtual exchange can now be a means of meaningfully connecting us to our partner universities and other stakeholders in our partner regions, be it in Europe or in the wider world, and especially also connecting us to our Scottish partners. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Hildhard. Um, so then um, I would suggest, um, Sarah, you take uh, over directly. Thank you very much, Burkhard. <clears throat> um, it's lovely to be with you all. Um, uh, it feel, feels quite unusual. I'm used to sitting here talking to a Scottish audience and our members and people we know well. It's quite exciting to introduce all of you people all over Germany into my living room, but you're very welcome. Um, so I feel like a slight imposter on today's programme um, as I am not a professor or a doctor and I don't even work in a university. Um, but what I think the organising team had been keen for us to do was to share some of our experience of working with universities rather than within them. Um, and given that basically we only exist to work in collaboration and uh, knowledge transfer, I suppose we wouldn't normally use those words, but I think knowledge transfer is what we exist to help with, to do, to create pathways, to help build relationships. Um, and develop capacity to enable partners in Scotland, um, Germany and in other parts of the EU and internationally to be able to kind of have a common conversation around a lot of the, the challenges that we're facing, whether in research or wider innovation that don't respect boundaries and um, don't necessarily care about our cultural differences and specificities um, and being that kind of bridge to help those conversations along. Um, just to pick up where Burkhart was on who we are, so I work um, in Scotland House here in Brussels. My part of the team focuses on supporting non-governmental actors, our universities, other parts of the public sector, business organisations, trade unions, to engage in, in, in working in collaboration with European partners, but we're part of a broader team that includes the Scottish government. And we're actually part of an international network now of Scottish um, kind of hubs and offices around the world, including we've got teams in, in, in Germany and in uh, Dusseldorf and Berlin. Um, so one, what we're there to do is to help facilitate those connections and networks. There's a particular focus in our work on innovation. And historically, we've always worked very, very closely with um, universities in Scotland and University of Glasgow is one of our um, longstanding members. And as I also studied there, I'm particularly happy to be part of this conversation and to see how I think um, these kind of bilateral relationships that universities have always had, we're now looking at using them in, in a much broader way. Um, so the perspective that I was going to come from was less on the technology side, but that idea of the university as part of a wider kind of innovation ecosystem and how thinking about that and thinking of, of the universities as part of that broader community of shared interest can be really helpful in this next phase of where we go with knowledge transfer and kind of developing capacity for people to do more and um, and to do more with that. Um, I think in Scot the Scottish context, in terms of our international engagement, um, we have done a lot of kind of help building on our Europe international work to help develop how we do our work at home. We've got a very um, broad uh, innovation ecosystem 
there's a lot of interaction between universities, public sector, private sector. And I think the kind of the, all the different parts of the public sector feeling themselves to be part of that story is actually something that's very important. We often tend to focus on technology transfer in a kind of university conversation between universities and businesses. And often that's a gap that's too broad to bridge and people don't have the, the right knowledge and the right language often to talk to each other. Bringing in that wider public or civil society aspect can sometimes help find a more a common conversation and, and, and focus the collaboration more effectively. So the kind of cross-agency multi-partner collaboration is, is how we kind of approach supporting and developing our innovation ecosystem more broadly. And I think it's also a kind of a quite a place-based approach. And I think that's also something where for the universities, while being inherently international and European in focus, also thinking about our place in a physical place around us and the role they have there has been really helpful in thinking about the broader role that universities can play in building relationships and helping with that kind of knowledge transfer. Um, also, I suppose just to address the kind of critical thing of we're Scotland Europa, we're still here, we're part of Scotland House in Brussels, we have no intention of changing the work that we do in any of this. There was a conversation earlier this morning obviously about funding and future engagement programme, we've, we've talked about Brexit a lot. But the, the core of our work, the cornerstone of our work, I suppose, is the fact that working in collaboration will always be part of what, what we need to do, what we want to do. Um, it was really lovely to have those very clear framework of European rules and programmes. We hope to still be involved in them, but we'll want to continue the types of work we do with our partners anyway, and we will find ways to do that. Um, I think that was came across quite strongly from speakers this morning. Um, but what we also recognise is most of the time, when we're facing the kind of challenges for research and innovation we do at the moment, we simply will not have the knowledge and skills any one organisation or any one place to do that by ourselves. And we'll get there further, faster working with others. Um, so we will remain committed to that um, in Scotland. Um, and I think we are at a place in Scotland where that understanding of the kind of knowledge transfer networks collaboration is not just something that's a kind of a common currency in conversation in our universities, but really across the kind of public sector and in, in policy discussions. Um, I certainly think at this point in time, much more so in the 20 years I've worked in this work, you see this understanding now in, in a lot of our kind of public policy documents as well. And I think that's something that's really important that there's much more visibility of the role of all of the parts of our innovation ecosystem. Universities don't just appear when we talk about research or about education. They appear in, um, for example, our economic development strategies in Scotland. They appear in our internationalization strategies and our ambition for how we're seen white in the world as a kind of cornerstone of that work. But that only comes from them being seen as connected with all of the other partners that are doing that work together. Um, and I think this is something that we see very much that sometimes universities actually exclude themselves from conversations because they're not inherently science or research focused. Whereas the knowledge, the expertise, the connections within a university could add so much more value to some of the public policy conversations that are happening on a European and international level, but which don't explicitly have universities in, in the title. And I suppose that's one of the observations from our work is one of the things we feel that we've been able to add more value for Scotland or from Scotland to wider European collaborations is bringing some of our universities and or some of their work into broader kind of conversations. Um, obviously, you have to fund your research, that's kind of core focus, you have to find opportunities for students, but using the kind of in knock on opportunities, I think one of we had our, in the informal lunch this this um, this afternoon, which uh, Lisa hosted for us, I think this was the thing, of, there was this idea of trying to find a language to put around the additional um, value that's created from working in collaboration and doing kind of knowledge transfer is one of the problems is if you can't name it, it's hard to value it. And these kind of broader benefits, I think one of the, the um, participants said, they called it reciprocal, they called the principle of reciprocal equity. I didn't know there was such a wonderful academic term for the, the kind of how we've always seen our work and done our work, but it, it that resonated with me a lot, this idea that, that it, you're generating value from doing the work, from building the relationships, from seeing the transfer maybe less as a transactional process and more as something that's about a long-term relationship building to add value in multiple transfers or multiple projects and programmes over time. Um, and this is certainly something that we've seen in our work of working with universities and stakeholders over many years in different partnerships and different programmes 
that the ones where you feel that the value then becomes something that doesn't just come back to university but can be passed on to other partners can be picked up in the wider ecosystem can start affecting longer term policy often come from where people have worked together for a very long time so they trust each other with developing an idea or a thought beyond just what they have to put down to kind of win the money for the award or the program um, and I think that is something that for us is very important that we continue that work um, and or it's very important for how we make sure that Scotland stays very involved with all of our partners even if in this period when we're not sure exactly how we will work in terms of um, the EU future programmes and so on. That commitment to that kind of collaborative approach, the, the belief in generating that kind of value when we're facing common problems and so on. And I think the ability to work with other partners and, and find ways to more effectively share knowledge and information is really important because most of our challenges that don't respect boundaries now are also challenges that don't it's not just the geographic boundaries they don't respect they don't respect the boundaries of our, our previous approach to looking at different disciplines or schools and so on within an academic context and sometimes having other partners in the process I think of the kind of sharing of knowledge that are not the ac just academics who don't already know about where those let's say set um, boundaries between different disciplines are can help that conversation as well. If you have other public sector partners or business partners whose focus is the product you create or the wider societal value you generate, they're less they're less likely to be inhibited by what would be seen as more difficult boundaries within a in university based um, conversation. And obviously, this is not just ideas that come from our work in Scotland. I mean, we are very um, much learning through working with others. In, in the European policy process and we're very active in a lot of European networks and most of our our work in Brussels and networks are focused on those networks which bring together multiple partners. Obviously you know, our universities such as Basco are very much involved in the same with, with the partners in uh, Lower Saxony and university focused networks but we feel we can add value to that by being in broader based with networks where we're bringing together different actors but who have a shared interest in research and innovation policy and programs about how we learn from each other to support and develop our innovation ecosystems and to enhance the kind of research and innovation capacity within our regions. Um, and this is where we work more with our universities to try and to create more space to be able to focus on that kind of broader based work as well as the kind of projects and program work. Um, mm -hmm. And I think some of that's, that's the kind of work that I think be interesting to do more of and work more closely with to see the university not uh, just involved in more the let's say that that transactional side of the knowledge transfer mm -hmm. or having knowledge that is pushed mm -hmm. out to a company to make it into a product but being seen as a broader yeah. partner in the kind of innovation ecosystem developing that system and also the policies that that support them okay sarah um i i i would love you to continue but but i think uh, we we can for sure pick this up uh, in our discussion um, so if, if you would allow, uh, I would uh, I would hand over to Manfred then uh, as the next speaker. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much. I'm trying to share my slides. Let me see if that works. So can you see the slides? So can you see the slides? Yes, thank okay. you. Good. So just maybe some some more uh, general comments. Um, I mean, we are all used to talk about transfer, maybe technology transfer and, and knowledge transfer. Uh, I'm trying to hear some uh, address some more generic aspects, the way I feel about them presently. And uh, maybe we can agree on that. We now have some times that are well characterized by some sort of fragmentation and crisis on several levels. And uh, for me, transfer um, can be considered a vital contribution to mutual understanding, consensus, synergy, and progress. So it's not just a very specific function of this transfer notion. Uh, transfer happens for a long time under several disguises. Um, for example, at Theo Braunschweig, we don't consider transfer a third pillar of our activities. We consider it an inherent activity in research and teaching. So there cannot be research and teaching without transfer. Uh, and that's why we don't 
really consider uh, or, or share this, this uh, view of the third uh, pillar or column. And when we talk about transfer, um, of course, it's about sharing, but it's not only about sharing of, let's say, solutions in a broader sense or some ideas and technology and knowledge, but also sharing uh, of problems and, and convictions and conditions. Because if we really want to go for sustainable transfer on a larger scope, we have to understand our partners, our transfer partners. And so we have to understand their convictions and also their conditions, their restrictions. And then we can discuss mutual options on how transfer can be more efficient and, and widened and uh, intensified. So I think that's important. It's not only about a low level kind of transfer. We have some results that we can share or we have some advice that we can share. But if you really want to have uh, in-depth transfer and communication, then you also have to talk about what is different and better do this before you start going into details. So um, I also would like to point out that in my view, transfer is a sort of a multi-scale process because again, we have transfer within each organization that is part of the whole transfer chain. Uh, so for example, in each of our universities, uh, we have of course transfer um, between different groups, um, between administration and management and uh, the lecturers and so on, and the students, of course. So, but then we have uh, cooperation and transfer at a regional level that is within the specific universities and their local region. Of course, then there are many stakeholders, uh, which I try to indicate here below. Um, and the key is that transfer is tailored specifically for a pair of uh, senders and receivers, so to speak. So we cannot have one transfer concept that fits all groups. Yeah? So we have to get to know our partners. And that's, of course, um, quite a challenge because these partners are quite uh, diverse in nature and also they have very different interests uh, so that ranges from very specific research cooperation and, and technology transfer patents and and so on to sort of more diffuse uh, activities of, of general knowledge transfer of how does the university work or how does science work i mean we are in the time where the notion of science is by far not, not only a positive one. So we also have to discuss like meta topics that are of general interest to the society at large. And so I think um, there's so much to do on, on this area and um, cooperation that is, uh, has already started and is intended to intensify between uh, Scotland and Lower Saxony, there's ample opportunity, but it takes a bit to learn to get to know each other and then tailor uh, transfer to our specific needs and, and possibilities. So one might also ask who's responsible for transfer. And, and I think it's fair to say that uh, one could say that everybody who participates in and defines expectations from transfer should take care of it. It's not a one way road. It's always a mutual relationship it's a give and take uh, that should take place. Otherwise, there will be uh, no real transfer on a long-term basis. But of course, universities in particular are expected to actively initiate and foster transfer because of their fundamental role in research and education. So that's clear that uh, universities are a societal player that has to take the initiative and, and has to actively engage in transfer. Um, I believe that transfer is not an equilibrium activity. So once you initiate it, then it just runs and, and that's fine. So it's not an equilibrium activity, but rather a process that requires constant adaptation um, because societal challenges and conditions change and you have to react to these specific challenges. Uh, you also have to cope with varying degrees of resources. Yeah? And um, by the way, many especially politicians talk about the, the role of transfer, but are not so keen on funding this. So it's not that this can be done just as a side job. 
Now, there has to be some incentive for those participants also to engage in transfer and, and to make this really something that works out and that requires also specific resources. So, um, I, I think it's safe to assume that uh, all the institutions uh, that we are talking about here uh, in both Scotland and Lower Saxony already have uh, included some transfer activity as part of the institution's governance. So there is a process and it will then be very important to get to know the mutual ways uh, transfer is organized uh, in the corresponding universities and also in different cities that then work on cooperation in terms of transfer. So what should we do then now to get going, especially between Lower Saxony and Scotland? Uh, under constraints given by political circumstances. So we all know that we want this, but it's not clear what the boundary conditions are. So I think uh, we should try to identify potential stakeholders and their interests on both sides, bring them together, uh, establish community building. That sounds simple, but that takes some effort. Now we have the time uh, to prepare this. Uh, I mean, we can do virtual conferences anytime, but we can also think ahead into the future. Maybe in one year, uh, present meetings will be possible again. And then we should use the time now to prepare these and, and uh, really do a good planning so that community building can take place efficiently uh, and fast. Then, of course, we have to build on existing transfer institutions. Um, and of course, identify lead individuals to drive the process. Yeah, that's always the case. You need some, a few people, experienced people that are willing to drive the process uh, to make it a success. Then of course, we can also use the time, uh, Corona time for applying for funding for dedicated projects that could be different sources for funding. But again, that's part of the game without proper funding the quality of the projects will probably suffer. And then, of course, once we are successful, at least with some of the initiatives, then we should communicate those successful activities to other partners to generate role models for this transfer and then to create a positive resonance for on a larger scale. So then just a few ideas for what we could do next. And then I would like to stop here and uh, would be curious about your further uh, contributions and then the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Manfred. Um, so uh, I think uh, next would be Miles Paget. Um, so Lisa, will you try to start the video snippet? Yes, now it, I'm going to start it now. Okay. Hello, my name is Professor Miles Paget, and I am the lead scientist in Quantic. Quantic is one of the four UK quantum technology hubs, with our specialism being in quantum enhanced imaging. A little over five years ago now, the UK government identified that in the UK, quantum science was an area where it felt we had strong international strength in terms of our scientific output. And it decided at that point to embark on a 10 year program to support the translation of these quantum technologies into, um, uh, into UK based industries, by which I mean companies that are UK companies, but also international companies that have significant presence within the UK. And to do that, they put in now something approaching one billion pounds of uh, UK government money to support that effort. So the hub that I lead is called Quantic, and it is a consortium of eight different universities from around the UK, three in Scotland and uh, three other ones in Scotland and four more in England. But in addition to the eight universities, it is also closely supported by over 40 different companies with a UK presence. And it's this company presence that makes our centre different from simply being another research centre on its own. 
So one of the big things we did now approaching five years ago was think differently about how we might take a technology such as quantum technology, which most people would perceive at being quite low technology resident levels, a long way from uh, commercialization, and take that emerging technology and accelerate its transition from the research lab into the commercial marketplace. And so we took 20% um, of our uh, recurrent funding something approaching four million pounds and we didn't spend it we put it in a drawer so to speak and we kept that money set that money to one side so that during the course of the program we could instigate and support joint uh, projects partnerships of different types with industry now those industrial partnerships took several different forms one way of course that universities and companies can work together is through the co-funding of PhD students. And we did that. That pushes forward the science, it pushes forward the technology, and indeed it creates a career pathway whereby those students can transfer their own careers, post-academically speaking, into the industrial base. Another area where we were active was we set up uh, the fund to support uh, proof of concept funding, where the, the center, ourselves, Quantic, went on a approximately 50-50 split with the company and we co-funded a project aimed at verifying the use of a particular science technology, quantum technology, in their industrial application. And from that, that essentially started then the pipeline uh, from taking the ideas from the research lab into the company. And we invested upwards of uh, two million pounds in, in that scheme alone. And then we created some lab space where companies and the academics could co-locate to pursue a joint validation of technology. And last and by far means no means least, we created a dedicated business development team with sector specialism, so not generalists, people with specific knowledge of the quantum photonics area. And their job was effectively to create those partnerships for the studentships, for the projects, or indeed uh, additional funding relating to other uh, schemes or transfer opportunities. So looking back at the scorecard, uh, we, we did a, a pretty good job, both in terms of the scientific output, but in relation to what I'm talking about here, that, that pull through of technologies into the companies. And so we supported something of order 40 joint projects with the companies taking the quantic technology, validating it within their own applications. Those projects and other things have resulted in 13 products either available or shortly to be available and under last stage development. We supported four startup companies and indeed supported a, a substantial number of patents being filed protecting the technology for current and future use. So the kind of projects that we developed, uh, some pictures here, range from uh, cameras that, that were able to spot and detect flammable or toxic gases as they leak, as it leaks from pipes. Uh, we developed a, a new kind of, of microscope uh, based on fluorescence lifetime imaging with much higher throughputs than before. There is a new kind of sensor for measuring the uh, variations in gravity uh, as you move through um, the, your surroundings, allowing you to find buried pipes uh, or to do geological surveys or indeed surveying for oil and gas. And another area where we've been massively active uh, surrounds auto, auto, autonomous vehicles, automotive LIDAR, 3D imaging using photon time of flight. But I, rather than talking about the technology, I think the thing that I'm most proud of within the context of what we were able to achieve in Quantic was the translational mechanisms that we put in place. And I think key to that was essentially making sure we had unallocated resource, which we could bring to support opportunities as they presented themselves during the course of the project. And that is the mode of operation that we are carrying through in, into the second phase of the program. So um, thank you all very much uh, for, for listening to uh, what I've had to say. I hope that it's of interest, really delighted to follow up in the discussion with any aspects of it, learn from each other, or indeed, if you would prefer, please follow up with by email with me. So thank you very much indeed. 
Yeah, so wonderful. I think Miles uh, um, hasn't joined us so far, but hopefully he will. Um, so I would like to come to uh, our final speaker, and that is uh, Christina von Haaren. So if you would take over, it would be nice. Thank you very much, Burkhard. And um, I think this, this was a really fascinating example of how uh, the knowledge transfer or knowledge exchange can be fostered. Um, my talk is a little bit more in the line of what Manfred Kraftschick said, or it is quite in, <laughs> very much in this line. Um, but I hope I can add some um, more facets uh, to the very nice overview he gave us and also the ideas he presented. I also would start uh, with a statement that transfer between universities and societies is a two-way road. And um, uh, maybe I say a word about my, my personal perspective <clears throat> on this whole subject. <clears throat> Sorry. I would say it is bifocal. Uh, on the one hand, uh, I come, of course, uh, from an international perspective, and I will end up with some um, <clears throat> proposals about cooperation or how we can do this be between uh, Scotland and uh, uh, Lower Saxony. But I, I'm also an environmental scientist and as an env environmental scientist, I see that not all uh, 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 scientific results are welcome um, at the addresses we would like uh, uh, to, uh, them to take up the results. So it is very, very important that we consider the perspective, the interest of the addressees of our research. Um, let, me, let me start with what I, after this um, little introduction, let me start with what I consider maybe preconditions of successful knowledge exchange. And we have here fee two fields of action. We have on the one hand, the transfer between universities or the exchange between universities, and on the other hand, the exchange between universities and the wider society. And um, I think when we um, are talking about universities, um, there we are on quite trodden path, I would say. We have Erasmus uh, Plus, we have uh, European research funding now, Horizon Europe and so on, both supporting transfer between universities concerning all groups um, of the universities from administrative staff uh, students to professors. However, there are quite a lot of deficits which I see still um, apart from these wonderful conditions and challenges. Deficits um, we can identify in the number of students taking part in exchange. And students are also kind of, um, they are important for knowledge uh, exchange because they, um, student exchange does not only open up their minds to this idea at all, but they also learn things, but they also bring ideas into the um, others, uh, into the um, European universities or in international, in the, in, into the international realm. Um, the number of students taking part in these exchanges is too low. If I look at the Asian universities and their targets for student exchange, uh, take the Chinese or um, take Singapore, the Taiwanese, they have at least um, a number of maybe 50%, 80%, Singapore University even wants 100%. And we are far from this, though our preconditions are very, very good. Furthermore, EU research money is not applied for by all of the colleagues who could, uh, who are interested in or who should do it because they have something to contribute. Um, partly because the administrative burden seems too high, um, teaching loads are too high, but partly uh, partly young scientists have to first build up their networks, partly because also very excellent um, of our co uh, colleagues, 
they, in Germany at least, they sometimes prefer German um, research council money uh, because it's better valued in the universities or better appreciated in the universities. So we have to do something about this, I think. And then let me come to the, uh, to the frame conditions in the knowledge transfer between universities and wider society. And um, I would like to make uh, two points. One point is, and I think Manfred Kraftschick has also <laughs> already said this, this is, um, yeah, this is really a, a two ways road and uh, the, the magic word would be transdisciplinary science to include practice into research, not only when we have the results, but from the very beginning and also to go out with um, labs. And this is not, not only a matter of technical sciences, um, but it's also a matter of social sciences because um, we have to communicate not only with companies uh, or entrepreneurs who want to use our scientific results, but we also have to, um, we have to communicate with politicians, decision makers. We have to communicate with the real wide society, with the citizens, and we have to communicate with institutions such as administrations, um, also NGOs, because um, a lot of us produce uh, science which is relevant. And you can imagine when I talk from environmental science, I also the NGOs are interested in what we are doing. And on the other hand, um, I see that there are difficulties and some of these have been mentioned this morning already. For instance, difficulties can arise yet now in the when we cooperate with companies or, or industri industry um, also in the technical real with patents with licenses uh, but also when a company pays university researchers um, there may be a bias um, or there may be the suspicion of a bias because the money comes from an interested party um, so this is a, a matter of how independent do we stay in this, in this uh, relationships. And then of course, I mean, we have talked a lot already about the barriers of um, conversation. And what usually is said is we shouldn't use expert language, um, of course not, but I think there is more to that. And also this has been mentioned by Manfred Kraftschick in order to really communicate with our addressees in practice, and now I'm addressing the universities, we need to understand them. We need to understand their interests, but we also need to understand the way they are thinking. Um, and research uh, results sometimes are kind of uh, under the surface of public or, or addressee um, uh, attention and then suddenly we have this phenomenon now with our virologists or epidemiologists suddenly this evolves and then it's good when you have your research at hand but you also have to um, to have to think about how do I communicate this to the politicians who cannot who, who think in a really different logic than we do and I have been more than eight years advisor in the advisory board to the German government in environmental affairs. And um, so I, I learned a lot about the huge gap between how uh, we as scientists will frame a problem or a result and how politicians need it to be framed in order to react. Um, so there, there is a real, I would say it, this, we even need a discipline between us and the politicians because we are not in Germany, we say a Wolperdinger, that's an animal um, made of completely different animal parts. Uh, so we cannot do everything and we have to think how we will set up this at the universities in order to be better, to better communicate. Now my, my, um, proposals or 
they are still rough ideas, but maybe we, we can discuss what we can make of it. Um, one thing is that my experience also now in my, um, in my function as a vice president international, now also for sustainability, is that we need more stable networks. And one form to do this might be the uh, European universities because we need short connections between the universities in order, and we need very, very good knowledge, not only of one strategic partners of a few, but um, in such a European network. Now, Scotland, what, what will become of the UK and, and Europe thing? We have already addressed this um, quite a lot this year. But um, the, I think the new strategy of the EU will also allow kind of uh, affiliated partners, uh, kind of second rank partners. But we can think when we uh, think of the lower Saxony Scotland connection of um, including when we are when we want to take part in this European initiative, including also uh, Scottish universities in this. Um, because the European network, they include a lot. They include teaching, they include research, but and they also include uh, knowledge transfer or can include that. So if we if we decide for knowledge transfer, um, we can of course um, we can of course um, design our European projects in a way that they are more. Um, transdisciplinary. And there is another European instrument, uh, instrument which can or could help us with that. Um, and that is the Interact program, which is also now as a, and, and the European Union in the European, um, in the Horizon Europe program uh, has a more elaborated part of um, uh, knowledge exchange with practice, but interact is a traditional thing. However, uh, it is a kind of penalty for a researcher to do an, an uh, interact project. I know this um, by experience because the administration is horrible. Um, the universities are uh, treated like a private company with no um, check and with no financial check in its own. And um, so uh, there are external, no, I, I, you can ask me when you want to know more about that, but I think it's dysfunctional and it's, um, it is not um, supporting uh, this line of thinking. And finally, um, uh, when we can foster um, contact between um, between companies of different in, in the different regions where the universities are uh, and the regions in, uh, in Lower Saxony and in Scotland, if we could think um, by some institutional support for that. Uh, without bloating up um, uh, the administration too much, more in the sense that we put together our um, our different strength and um, try to work maybe a little bit more in in the in the in in, in the mode of shared labor. Um, I was very much impressed when I was doing research at Cornell University in the U.S. Um, uh, by the by the institution of an extension service, and. Um, this is a kind of um, practice, practice university institution, which um, is not the same as Fraunhofer or something like that, but really is, is organized by the university, but sends PhD students out into practice. And on the other hand, get practitioners, for instance, um, uh, technical advisors from practice in the university. And both sides have very much benefited from this um, institutional um, finance by the state, but uh, by this, uh, from this institutional um, yeah, uh, setting, uh, setting. Now, um, maybe my, my last 
uh, point is what can we do about um, our the language in which we communicate in language in the white sand what can we do about that <clears throat> the only thing <coughs> sorry I, I this is not COVID, <coughs> but <laughs> it's just <laughs> so I think we might um, think of setting up um, a common project um, about that because this is really something which has which is very very multi um, uh, multi perspective and we need to include, as Manfred said, we need to include the specifics of our addressees. We need to include also the different languages they speak. Um, we need to include things like, um, I would say almost a nudging. <laughs> um, uh, what can we use of uh, this whole uh, behavioral science part? And um, at least we, sh we should get some advice from that side. And uh, we need to, and this is maybe might be the uh, most important, we need to kind of collect and bring together the different experiences we have in our different states, in Scotland and Lower Saxony, about the pitfalls, but also the chances of um, mutual collaboration between practice and universities. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Christina. I think, um, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks to all of you. Um, I think we, we, we saw quite a few very interesting um, discussion starter points. So I feel that, that one topic was uh, resources and, um, and, and, and free resources uh, that potentially might help. I mean, it's always easy to, to ask for more money, um, but I think this, this was one point. Um, the other topic um, about, so to say, conversation that came up again and again, and not only bilateral communication, but also what I would call multilateral communication. I think, Sarah, there was something uh, you brought up. Um, and also um, this, this, this topic, uh, Christina, you mentioned um, last, which, which I liked a lot, perhaps, as a potential template for what we could do. Uh, there was this this idea of the extension service that you uh, that you mentioned from from Cornell, and I wonder whether we perhaps could jump into that um, uh, a bit more. Um, so, what I would suggest um, we uh, we have spent uh, roughly one hour, and uh, we roughly have thirty or thirty five minutes um, left for the discussion. So, I would, uh, if you agree. I would suggest we open up, so to say, for questions uh, from the auditorium already, and uh, and perhaps to kickstart it, if if, uh, if there aren't any questions, I I could jump in, um, but perhaps uh, we we should ask, um, so to say, our auditorium to to come up with questions. So, I think there is. Um, let me see. There is one large. Uh, comment here. Thank you for inspiring input. Uh, would you agree that COVID-19 has the result in a better reputation of the science in the wider public? What could scholars in humanities whose research might not be so easily transferable as, for instance, medical research do to find wider acceptance of the work? Um, and that is from Stefanie Brusberg, uh, and she's a professor of English at Hildesheim University. So I think uh, that's that, that's perhaps, if you allow, uh, quite an interesting question. So uh, it, it, it addresses, so to say, uh, disciplines which are, let's say, rather far away from uh, from from uh, knowledge transfer. And um, I wonder uh, what would be your position. I don't know, uh, Hiltraud, would you perhaps uh, want to jump in on, um, on on this question? So what could humanities and and uh, and other disciplines that are not Medical science do. Maybe I cannot answer concerning English, maybe, but I think the social innovation aspect is a very important one. And Christina already mentioned it so that we do not only work on technological innovation, but also on social innovation through social sciences and humanities have an important role to play in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Christina, what, what's your position on that? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, but this is a kind of uh, not i mean we have a lot of communication we know a lot about communication but we don't know i think a lot about the 
um, we don't know enough about our addresses. I think, and and in what situation they take up what um, what uh, advice, for instance, or what results. Uh, I mean, if I if I you have introduced me <laughs> on working on agriculture and environment, and this is a very good or a bad example. Because um, in this case, our addressees, they don't want the uh, scientific results. Um, and um, <laughs> so how, how can you find a way, nevertheless, to bring that into practice somehow? Mm -hmm. And we found a way via the uh, big food enterprises. They wanted our research completely different e experience for me. Uh, because I had tried to to bring this into ad agricultural administration for decades, um, and then suddenly, boom, um, something happened. Or um, after um, some time, also some agricultural advice, technical advice institutions. So uh, you have sometimes uh, you are kind of spending your energy on the wrong mm -hmm. side because you, I mean, you you see, okay. Um, the farmer might like to take it up, but he is very in dependent on the EU agriculture and the state agricultural policy. And um, so his, his, um, his, his range of opportunities he has to take the research up is very limited. Mm -hmm. um, in, other, in other fields of knowledge, we also work on renewable energies. Um, we can't almost... Um, there's such a big demand for the results we have that we almost cannot satisfy that. So um, it is really super different and we need strategies and um, strategies for the different um, situations. And also um, what has already been said today um, in terms of multilateral cooperation between universities, um, their stakeholders, I would say, and the international, uh, or the in, in terms of Scotland, uh, Lower Saxony, uh, the B national, um, can I say national? No, um, the B state <laughs> um, relations. Uh, we need a format how to how to find maybe stakeholders in the other mm -hmm. country who want mm -hmm. to take up our results because the, the situations are different and the yeah. stakeholders could communicate. Christina, may, may I jump in? So I, yeah. I, I could imagine that, that Sarah <laughs> probably could contribute to that because I mean, it was so to say your main theme that you said this multilateral communication and conversation is, is so important. And I. I really therefore like this question a lot because I mean, it's to a certain extent the question, who is the, the right receiver of my message? And yes. perhaps multilateral level uh, communication or conversation, so to say, actually might help you to identify the right receiver, right? Uh, so so what, what's your position on that? Yeah, I come. Uh, sorry. Sorry. So, sorry, I, uh, so, sorry this, this, this question, Christina, sorry for interrupting you. No, 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 no. I, 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 to, to Sarah, so. What would you say? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that this is a really interesting, um, it's making me reflect a lot on the work that we do. And I think when I started working with universities in terms of their EU engagement 20 years ago, I think we very much took that as the university, this is what we're working on, this is our research, how can you help us connect it with the right people who would use it or do something with it? And I think that's, a, that's always gonna be hard because you already, you have your product finished and you're almost looking for a buyer, except you don't really want to sell it. It's, you know, so there's a, there's a complicated relationship there. I think what we're doing more now, and I think the European programs are actually more focused on, is trying to find a community of interest to solve a problem, to look at a challenge, so that you're formulating the questions together, so you know how to address the research as you, do, as you develop it. And so you develop that kind of relationship and the trust. So when you're going along and saying, actually, you might not like what we're finding out, but you should be prepared to think about what you will then do rather. And I think that's a really important change. Um, I think though, it's one of those things. And I, I think one of the speakers 
here this morning kind of said it, it it's hard to plan for that it's much easier for that to come as part of work you've already done and relationships you already built but i think though the more that um and i know that this is hard that universities seeing universities as one organization or institution that's one of the problems that outsiders in the in ecosystem have is that's how they see the universities it's not really how university functions but trying to work out i think a little bit of who can speak for the university on a constant level who can keep people informed about the specific research that's being done when the researchers and scholars maybe are not at a place that they can be having that conversation so you don't have to wait till the end of the process to find out who to tell about it to then find out that they don't want to hear about it and i think that's the kind of the the, the, the really important space at the moment about but whether it's in humanities or science or whatever is to be having these ongoing conversations with a wider range of partners about the broader role of universities the kind of research that you're doing so that then it's much easier to bring together the specific community to talk about what we have learned in agricultural science or what we're learning about climate change or what we're learning about pandemic control or so or, or so on and i think that's where work the kind of broader multi-university multi-partner kind of ecosystem to ecosystem exchange the more that other partners are working on those conversations and stories with other partners in other places the the, the smoother those pathways will become mm -hmm. for the specific university knowledge mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean that you then are all your research has to be paid for by an end user it also means that but you're connected into a broader conversation that doesn't necessarily just involve businesses or purchases of, of the research, but the intermediaries who might use it in completely different ways than the researchers ever imagined. Mm. I, I feel that um, it might depend, so to say, on the discipline or perhaps even on the project um, topic, whether, uh, so to say, some, uh, I think some of you guys called it uh, institutional support for this knowledge transfer idea might support this thing. So there, there might be so to say, a position at the university or perhaps in something like an ECAS, uh, which, so to say, could help on that. But I'm, I'm sure that in, in some disciplines and in some projects, so to say, you need to be very close to what actually uh, uh, the research project is doing uh, in order to be able to communicate with external stakeholders. So and, and, and therefore, that might be something uh, to, to, uh, to, to actually look at. Right. So what what is this project actually doing? Monthly, you, you you are eager to to, to add to that. So go yeah, ahead. maybe uh, to say something that's that's obvious to some, but uh, it's one thing to do research on a very specific uh, topic, but all the global challenges to our society they are multifaceted, multidisciplinary problems. So we we have to abandon the idea that there is a single expert on this. And so there are lots of experts different, uh, working on different facets of the problems. And now what is needed and what, what we're generally lacking is the patience that this communication takes to establish really an exchange of, of different compatible or incompatible views. So what is typically missing is this idea of, uh, well, there's the one person knows it all and there's a simple answer to all questions. And so it takes more patience than we are typically willing to, to spend uh, to really work on, on sustainable solutions. And right now, as we see in many cases, we are, we are looking for very quick, very fast, very simple solutions. But uh, as we know from history, that that's not the case. So the world is pretty complex. And so it's an, a joint endeavor uh, that, that takes resources and time and it's not a, a job that is done uh, on a small time scale. So that's something that we have to be reminded of each of us uh, in our daily work. And especially when it's about uh, communication in the context of transfer to society. So there are, let's say, misled expectations on both sides and we have to work on, on um, yeah, improving communication on different levels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christina, you, you raise your hand. Yeah, I just uh, want to add, as you heard, I'm very much in favor of transdisciplinary research, of co-design and so on. But uh, 
we cannot only concentrate on, on that. It is also a kind of experience of my life as a scientist that we also, beside of a kind of co-design, we have to find our topics also by our own. Because um, I had this experience several times that we had worked on something which was of no real interest for the practice, for practitioners. And then suddenly there was a kind of change and, and a window of opportunity for politicians, for instance, and our results were asked for. And, and then it's, the time is too long to start with, with research and uh, have the right results in place. Uh, with with um, development of softwares or or uh, models and so on, this is really something which takes time, and um, so I I support what what Manfred Kafczyk said about the the long time we need and but we need this kind of double role of research of kind of going using your own creativity your own ideas and do it without that practice ask for it at the very moment, but at the also uh, to to um, be in close contact with the practitioners and take up uh, what what the need and the problems are. So that and I very much also like the the idea of this um, opening up the the possible addressee the, the number of possible addressees and um, people who want to want your research I would say by international collaboration because very often this also can create good examples best practice examples which then can uh, be transferred back to your own country so, so what what I, what I would like um, to uh, perhaps focus our uh, our discussion on is a little bit on on resources. Um, unfortunately, uh, Miles Paget hasn't joined us, but uh, I hope you liked uh, his contribution as much as as I did. I think it's uh, it's really a very convincing story of how knowledge transfer can uh, can actually work. And I was uh, struck by one comment uh, of him uh, at at the end. He said. Um, one one of the um, um, yeah let's say key uh, success factors uh, or for the for the translational mechanism was uh, to leave some money in the drawer and then uh, use it whenever it is necessary and then uh, Christina when you um, when 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 you said uh, 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 or talked about the uh, interact program I was reminded in a in a project we are currently uh, apply for and we have to discuss. Uh, and argue every single sheet of paper that we will use in the upcoming years of the project time. Uh, we have probably spent more resources on, uh, on on getting the money than really finally getting it. Um, so that's that's something that uh, that that really uh, struck me. And I wonder, so to say, uh, what opportunities you see um, to to actually make this possible? Is is there any uh, are there any ideas from uh, from from the panelists here? Um, so obviously, I would love to to ask Miles, but but that's really fascinating how they did it. Uh, Jim, you 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 know Miles probably better than we do, so uh, you are still muted. Go 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 and join us. Thanks, Burkhart. Um, and just just from conversations that I've had with Miles, um, one of the critical issues here was in not just in keeping a little bit of money for future potential and making sure you've got some reserves, but actually giving the industrial and commercial partners control over deciding where the money was being spent. Um, uh, it, it, you know, you bring 40 very busy industrialists and uh, commercially minded people together. How do you keep them on board? You can only keep them on board if they've got real jobs to do. So they don't want to come along and um, have a conversation over a cup of coffee about, you know, uh, future directions they want to know where's the money going to be spent and do we have any role in that now of course there are those in in, in universities and in academic life will say, who will say you know our our independence means that we can't simply be dictated to by commercial and industrial interests but that seems to me to um, uh, misunderstand the nature of academic freedom um, 
and academic freedom and personal license are not the same thing. When we take money from government or from uh, industrial concerns, and it doesn't really matter whether it's government or industrial concerns, when we take large sums of money, you know, other people are entitled to um, look at how that money can be spent. And keeping a really active board of 40 people um, really mm -hmm. committed to a project like Quantic requires mm -hmm. that they have a real job. Now, of course, they decide which projects are going to be funded in collaboration with the academics, mm -hmm. but they're not there to rubber stamp. And I think, you know, if, if we're going to be serious about the university engagement and knowledge transfer, then getting people just to make nice noises around us isn't enough. And Miles was very clear. I'd had, I had a conversation with Miles about precisely this. And he was very clear that the, the critical success was in getting so many industrialists involved and keeping them involved and making sure that they had a say in what kinds of doctoral um, research might be done, what kinds of research projects might be funded. Mm. Jim, Jim um, so, so taking, uh, taking this insight and, and taking the suggestions uh, Manfred Kravczyk came up with uh, in, in his talk, which I'm sure you, you have listened to, I wonder, so to say, what role ICAS could actually play there. So I think one of the success factors behind Quantic, if I understand it correctly, is, is also um, that they actually have a pretty specific focus. Yeah, at least from 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 the outside, and um, and I wonder whether this is so to say one of the success factors behind it to really get uh, external stakeholders engaged, or whether so to say we could um, also do this with ECAS as so to say one of the organizations that that try to to foster this and 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 then perhaps together with external stakeholders find out what the right topics are it, it's really an open question right uh, so I, I mean as you said these guys do not have to waste time right uh, uh, to 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 zip a coffee with us it, it it really they have some specific focus Hiltraut you you raised your hand yeah I wanted to, to tell you something about our European university, which might be an example how we work and which could be transferred to what ECAS could do. So what we did, we, we, we have a so, so we have regional ecosystem with nine universities, they're regional ecosystems, and these ecosystems are cooperations between the universities and, and, and uh, enterprises and other institutions of society. And we sat together, we, and we identified global challenges which are important for our regions. And then we had an interaction between the regions which are the joint global challenges we would like to address. And then we set up these living labs I talked about where we work on with incentive, uh, incentives where we work on these global challenges and addresses in living labs with researchers, with external stakeholders, with students, with doctoral students, etc. There is incentive money for this living lab, so you can apply for, for such kind of a living lab from the university together with the stakeholders. That could be something which could be adapted by ECAS as well, if it's not implemented already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, so therefore what, what, you, what you say is basically, even though living labs is probably a very broad term, it has a topic, right, at its core. Um, and, and, um, I would I would probably agree uh, that it actually needs something like that, and that so to say a very general approach to it uh, probably won't do the trick uh, to to really get get stakeholders on board. I mean, I, I think as as the exchange funding comes on stream, and we have a group of of Lower Saxonian and Scottish universities deliberating about you know how how we we make those funds available and for whom we make them available. Then as time goes on over the next year or two, we can start to see the shape of critical issues that, that join Lower Saxony and Scotland together that might benefit from this kind of consideration. I mean, we, we do know, um, and Sarah could say more about it than, than, than I can, but we do know that Lower Saxony is the lander most affected by Brexit. And we know from um, uh, ONS and other statistics that Scotland is the area most affected by Brexit in the UK. Um, Ireland is a slightly different proposition. 
Um, but uh, sorry, I should say Britain rather than the UK. Um, so we need to spend some time as we look at the projects that we fund, the decisions we make about supporting a handful of, of scholars um, to work with each other, um, whether then we start to see critical mass of people coming together. And then we start to think, well, does that critical mass suggest in this area or that area that we want to engage productively with, with um, outside bodies, agencies, companies, and so on? Mm -hmm. And then start to think about it a bit more strategically as a group of, of lower Saxonian and, and Scottish um, academics thinking about how we engage effectively. So I think we need a two to three year plan, but once, once we have launched the program, I think we can then begin to have detailed conversation. Manfred, I, I would like uh, to, to hear your view on it. I mean, I like this uh, list you came uh, up with, so to say, with concrete next steps that we that we could take. And and to a certain extent, I mean, uh, this this joint forum was was organized by ICAS, and, and obviously, I think uh, ICAS also is eager to learn on on, on how ICAS could so to, so to say support this and. And I feel that um, that we currently still focus very lot on, uh, on on the academic part of it, right? I mean, uh, obviously we are academics, and therefore that is our main focus. But I wonder, so to say, what what would would be your perspective on on perhaps how we could include external stakeholders um, in this? Well, I guess that that's to a certain extent about what I suggested in terms of get to know your partners. So each university has its regional partners in transfer, in knowledge transfer, in technology transfer. And now we have to learn how our partner universities in, in both uh, states um, organize this, uh, learn from each other, uh, maybe um, benefit from different designs and then uh, find an appropriate format of uh, funding, of mutual exchange, that not only university partners uh, participate in exchange, it doesn't matter if it's students or researchers or um, management members or administrative uh, personnel, all of these are of course uh, default part of the, of the transfer, but also pupils from uh, starting from low age uh, and, and up to seniors who have uh, experience in in long-term uh, relationships yeah so we could also think on larger scale projects like uh, becoming uh, twin cities uh, between I don't know Hanover and Glasgow Braunschweig whatever so there are small scale activities and larger scale activities and the larger scale activities they will take some time some years to develop but now it's about learning how each of us does transfer right now and then find appropriate formats to progress from there. Okay, thank you, S Sarah. You you um, you made a command in the chat. Yeah, I'm just aware that we're kind of running close to time, but I mean, if, and I think sometimes looking for focus, um, it's useful to kind of go what's already there, and I think that's some of the if we're thinking about the wider bringing together of the kind of ecosystem partners, then sometimes looking at what others are doing, not just the universities, and then seeing where the university can contribute might be a quick fix if there's ever such a thing for trying to find some focus, not maybe all of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, in our work, Lower Saxony and Scotland are both involved in things like the Vanguard Initiative at the European level, which is kind of focused on exactly what I think has come up a lot here of trying to find those areas where we have common challenges as regions that we cannot solve on our own, that we're going to have to bring in learning from others that's multi-sexual, multi-dimensional, multi-actor. Um, those are things that do involve the universities, but maybe more specific parts, like some specific institutes or so on. But using this kind of forum to say, what else are we already doing together? Could that help to give a focus rather than kind of reinventing the wheel or having to spend too much time trying to find where the next focus is but maybe giving more time or energies to things that are already in place. Mm. And one of the things is also to say, where is the most useful thing to actually know each other and be able to maybe even suggest other opportunities. So rather than building something new together, deciding the things that we don't, we're not the best partner with, so we won't waste time on because 
Lower Saxon would be better to be doing that with other German regions or another international partner and so on. And I think that's important is really being clear about the stuff with, that won't necessarily add value because this relationship is important, but it doesn't need to be everything to Scotland and Lower Saxony. Mm -hmm. And I think recognizing that also helps with, with focus and picking priorities too. Mm -hmm. But I think there are things out there with that wider community that the universities could contribute to as well as lead and maybe a combination of priorities that are both leads and contributive factors would be useful for the relationship going forward. Okay. Yeah, so, so it, it, to, to a certain extent, it sounds like uh, we need some kind of a, a I don't know, systematic uh, screening exercise um, to see where the potential actually is, right? And, and then uh, jump exactly on, 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 on these uh, aspects first, right? But I also like um, the, the, the idea which, which, uh, which came out of what, what Manfred said, it's, uh, it's, it's basically saying, uh, let's take uh, the theme of, of, of this uh, um, uh, panel uh, really literally and say, um, why not really taking ECAS and, and the universities involved as the bridge between, so to say, the, the, the regions, right? And bring together your cooperation partners in, in knowledge transfer um, and, and then see, so to say, whether they might even be, uh, uh, whether it might be mutually beneficial for, for these partners for, uh, or whether, so to say, I don't know, one university from, from Scotland could, uh, uh, could contribute to, to the solution of problems of, uh, of, of regional partners, right? So that's, uh, and that is probably something because it's, so to say, people to people communication, something that, that is more likely to work than, than some kind of a, I don't know, uh, I call it systematic uh, screening exercise, because if this is, so to say, done from, um, uh, from the organization only and not with, so to say, the researchers involved, I think this might be tricky. Um, so other um, questions other from, um, from the auditorium or remarks here from, uh, from, from this group? So I can't at least see any questions coming um, coming in. Okay. Um, so Lisa. Yes. Then it's time so for then, um, if if I can uh, briefly conclude. So um, so uh, yeah. Thanks uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, I mean that is uh, only a start, and I would. Uh, as we discussed, really love to see um, a, a specific, perhaps, format or conference that really focuses on um, on, on the topic of uh, of knowledge transfer. So hopefully, we will um, uh, remember this uh, this meeting as uh, as the starting point. I think it uh, really uh, could come with with great benefits uh, for for ACAS and the cooperation uh, between Scotland and Lower Saxony. So thanks to, um, to the panelists, um, thanks to the auditorium. And uh, again, uh, Lisa, uh, you as a representative here of, of ECAS, thanks for, uh, for organizing this. Thank you for this interesting panel from our side this whole day and those panel discussions were all a pleasure to listen to and we are really lucky that you all had the time to participate and to bring us those interesting insights. We would now have a short break um, if somebody wants to make a bio pause until um, 4.45 German time, and then there will be some concluding remarks. So you can either stay here or we will see us, to see us again at 4.45. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Burkhardt. Thanks. Thank you, Bukhart. Yeah, thank you for the facilitating.